Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for September 29th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. It is my pleasure to be joined once again by the City Council President, Matt McLaughlin. Matt, how are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Matt, you had your um, council meeting, regular council meeting last week. I just want to do a little quick update on the uh, COVID. COVID it seems to be holding steady in the city, but we have some surrounding communities where they are inching into um, what the governor now calls the red zone. And I was looking at that map on the dashboard earlier. It looks like they are communities that abut ours. Everett, uh, Everett is there, Medford is inching closer into the red zone. Um, and fortunately for us, we are holding steady in terms of the number of cases from last week and the number of deaths. Any other, any other major updates on the COVID response by the city? No, I would say that about uh, half the states in the country have seen an uptick in COVID. And although the surrounding cities uh, see, uh, are in the red now, uh, last week we talked about how Somerville was on the rise. So sometimes these numbers, uh, it's very unpredictable. Uh, sometimes there may not be an exact reason outside of the fact that disease spreads like this and we knew that it would come back in the fall. Uh, so I think you know the same, the status is still the same for the city uh, in terms of how we're addressing COVID. It's worked in a lot of ways, but it really depends on a lot of individuals cooperating together to uh, make sure that we stay this way. Well, I think you used the right word there, Matt, vigilance. We, you cannot become complacent um, just because the weather has changed and just because it appears as though more of the businesses are relaxing the restrictions about public entry. I wanna get into something that we can spend a little bit more time on today, Matt, and that is housing. As a result of COVID, um, different municipalities in different states put moratoriums on the eviction process because of people's inability um, to pay rent or pay mortgages or pay uh, any, any other types of debt that they may have for their housing. I want to talk about that a little bit because we are fast approaching to the deadline where the moratorium of October 15th is, did I have that date correct? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so that moratorium is going to be lifted on October 15th. And quite frankly, that's just a little over two weeks away. Do we have any movement or your sense about whether or not Massachusetts and the city of Somerville are talking about extending that out? I know that our state reps are working on that. My state rep, state rep in particular, Mike Connolly, would like to see that deadline extended. Uh, and then Somerville has also had a, before they got, the, um, the governor put out his moratorium, uh, we did have a freeze on evictions in Somerville uh, from the mayor. I'm not sure uh, how well that'll stand up if the state decides not to move forward on it, but it is very important. Uh, and as you mentioned, all the reasons why this eviction moratorium is in place, Another big part of the reason is we don't want people moving in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so, and we've seen recently that a lot of people did move and not saying that this is the correlation or the causation, but we experienced an uptick in COVID around the same time that people were moving. Uh, so we want people to stay in place when they can. And for this moratorium to be lifted, it's gonna be a real problem. And to be honest, it's gonna be a problem whenever we lift the moratorium because a lot of the, these people are still, once the moratorium is lifted, they're still gonna owe rent. Uh, this, then they may be months behind because they didn't have a job or they had no ability to pay rent. Uh, so it's really, COVID has just highlighted a problem that's existed well before uh, this crisis. And it's actually, Matt, when you think about it, um, it's a cascading event. So when the renter no longer has income, to pay their rent, the mortgage, uh, uh, the property owner um, takes a hit because they're not getting the rent. And then the bank who maybe holds the mortgage or the note on that property takes a hit because they're not getting paid by the property owner. Well, the bank the, always wins in the end, so. <laughs> well, the banks do, and you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned Rep Conley, both he and Rep Provo were on the show last week, and they were talking about um, their disgust 
quite frankly, with the federal government not being able to craft a program and target that program, the, the funding and the assistance directly to the people most impacted. And I asked them the question, what would be the best way to administer the program to give the banks some money to forgive the mortgage or to give the money directly to the renters? Do you have any sense on how that would work and what the best solution would be? I mean, we've seen how it does work. Um, and you know, we, don't, we first could look at the first bailout that the federal government provided went almost exclusively to big business with a small pittance to working class people who are struggling to survive. And if you go further back to the 2008 recession, uh, you could see how that worked is we bailed out the banks. And then when it came time to bail out the small homeowners who were screwed by the banks and uh, really lost everything, uh, all of a sudden that became a big problem. So unfortunately we have a uh, federal government that doesn't believe government should exist at all. And the only time they can help people is when they help in the billionaire class. So I think I'm getting a lot more political on that, but it, it's a fact that it's like we're, we're dealing with a government that doesn't think it's their responsibility to help people during a crisis, but we have to stabilize the economy for the, for the invisible hand or whatever imaginary people that they're protecting but people on the ground are not being protected. So I, I share the disgust of my uh, state reps that my state reps have. No, and I don't, I don't think it's political at all, Matt, because I think it's trying to explain to, you know, take it down to the street level here. You know, you're trying to explain to your constituencies that the, your constituents, that the city of Somerville can only do so much without assistance from the state. And the state can only do so much without assistance from the federal government. And I guess what you were referring to earlier is the, you know, in the 2008 economic meltdown, the federal government in their infinite wisdom decided that it was best to give the money to the banks. And then the banks misappropriated a lot of that money, you know, by giving executives big bonuses and, you know, all the rest that goes with, unless you have a very specific targeted program you will have big corporate greed putting their fingers all over the, the money that's supposed to go to the most vulnerable. Well, yeah, just to, not to get lost in the 2008 recession, but it's very a strong parallel to what's happening now is they bailed out the banks, which had to happen, it was necessary. But then when Obama got into office and tried to have a bailout program for people who were losing their homes, all of a sudden there was a serious backlash and that was a major contribution to losing Congress and having the Republicans take over office. And now years later, we have the situation where we had this huge bailout, uh, mostly for big businesses, for the airliners, for all these businesses affected by COVID, had to be done, it's necessary. But then once it came time to, why don't we help the everyday person, uh, that all of a sudden became an issue. So there, there seems to be, uh, these things operate in cycles and it's it's not something new unfortunately so let's take it back <clears throat> we'll take it back to the uh, municipal level right here in somerville um we we do have something that's in play um which is i i don't like to use the word tinkering we have been adjusting our um, zoning overlay systems and trying to bring them to 21st century code. Do we have a sense at this point about any of the major developments that are going on in Somerville? Do we have a sense that those may be seriously delayed because of the COVID pandemic? Well, that's a good question. You, you would think so. Um, you know, just based off what's happening, you would think that the whole economy is slowing down. Uh, in my experience as a ward counselor, I still have in development meetings regularly um, and people are still moving forward with their projects. But some of the problems I've seen well before COVID is some of these projects have not happened yet, even though they've been years in the making. So there's something going on that I can't particularly explain where um, development is stalled through no fault of the city, through no fault of the economy, uh, they have the ability to move forward on some of these projects and they haven't. So I'm having a development meeting tonight 
I had a development meeting last week for a really high-end uh, bio lab space in Assembly Square. Uh, so, you know, the big money is still moving forward, um, but we'll see what happens. I, I, I'm a believe it when I see it person. So I've had a lot of development proposals in my ward and not many have moved forward yet. And this was before COVID. But I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, it depends on the size of the development. So if you have, you know, a, um, a, a developer who's got three investors, you know, that's a little bit different than folks like US2 who have multinational investors pouring money into their developments. And as far as I can tell, Union Square is still ro rolling along. The steel is still coming in for the structures. Um, they're still building. Uh, Boynton Yards, we see one of those buildings starting to go up as we speak. Assembly Row, it still looks like they're moving ahead with a lot of the, the construction that they have. So I, I think from that standpoint, the larger developer developments may continue to move forward. But again, it's the smaller guy who's going to get hurt as a result of some well, of our- Well, you know, even the small developments are pretty big by my standards and yours, most likely. Um, and I have had, you know, I, I had a guy calling me the other day for a three unit apartment complex. He's frustrated that he hasn't gotten his permits yet. Um, so he's moving forward. I look out my back window and uh, people are doing construction on their homes. So there, there's still work being done. And this is all anecdotal. This isn't, um, you know, hard data. But in my experience in the ward as development has not slowed down. But I'll believe it when I see it. I, I want to see something happen before we, before I tell you that things are good or bad. Well, what's not anecdotal, Matt, is, you know, any of us who own our own homes, um, you know, we check on the property value to make sure, you know, gives us comfort that our major asset is not dropping in value. And I happen to look at my own and it's still increasing at a clip, you know, three months, quarter over quarter, it's increasing at a clip of around 5% a quarter. Yeah. I mean, that's astounding to me that Somerville is holding their own in terms of the real estate prices. And I think a lot of that is being generated by the policies that the city has, by the amount of development we have. And one of the major uh, pumps in that is the green line. So, you know, as people understand that rapid transit is a reality in the city, um, our property values continue to go up. I mean, it's a phenomenon that I can't explain fully that the economy as a whole seems to be slowing down and may be at a standstill, but Somerville itself continues to, to stay above the, the waterline on this thing. Well, I can't explain it fully either, but the green line is a huge factor and the green line is moving forward. It's actually uh, been moving forward a lot quicker because of COVID, because they have the time and ability to do this work. Uh, so that's, that's a huge reason. And if you look again at 2008, when the recession hit, it didn't impact some of all that much uh, because at the end of the day, people still want to live here. Uh, and that's the, that's the number one reason why it's so expensive to live here is people want to live here. And you know, there's a lot of people who have a concern that because of COVID, uh, you know, people are not going to want to live in the cities anymore. And I've read studies uh, or pay articles that have said that this is true in major cities like New York, Los Angeles, places like this. Uh, but most cities in general, people still want to live there. It's still the place to be. And right now, Somerville is very much the place to be. And we have the green line coming. So that's, I don't think that's going to change. But I'm more concerned about the housing issues we talked about before, where people can't afford to live here or they can't pay their rents and they're going to get evicted. Let's go back to it then, Matt, in terms of the eviction moratorium. Is there anything the city can do to stop it? Well, like I said, I think the mayor had a uh, eviction freeze that he instituted as an executive order. And I'm not sure how enforceable it is because we live in such, we live in a strong mayor system in Somerville, but then we live in a strong state government system in the state where the, we have to ask permission for the state for almost everything. So I don't know what happens if Charlie Baker doesn't extend the eviction moratorium and the city of Somerville wants to continue this. Uh, we'll find out, but. I would hope the city would keep their uh, eviction moratorium at least. But again, it's like this is going to end eventually. 
Um, so the, the pandemic will end and the moratorium freeze will have to end eventually. And people are still left in that terrible situation. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I think it goes back to the question of how much collateral damage or the federal government, the state government, the municipal government, how much collateral damage are they willing to absorb before the end of the pandemic and people start going back to work and people start earning income again and people stop relying on stimulus checks to keep their rent um, manageable. I mean, it's a conundrum that I think is only gonna exacerbate a lot of what we experience here in the city called gentrification. So yeah. as those folks who are not able to pay their rent move out of the city, the property owners may rehab it slightly and then charge even more rent. And that's the vicious cycle that we have. Yeah, and again, that, this was all before COVID as well. So it's only exacerbated a problem that's already existed. I think COVID uh, in, a, in a lot of ways has exposed a lot of class issues we have in the country. I think a lot of the reason uh, people are getting sick in certain communities is because those are the communities where people have to go to work. Uh, they're considered essential workers when an essential worker can mean working at Subway or Walmart or something like this. Um, but they're, they're essential and they have to go to work and they get sick as a result of it. Uh, the fact that they don't have health benefits so that they can't go and get tested to begin with or get the treatment necessary or to have preventative care, uh, that's a factor. There, there's a lot of factors involved and you know, the less money you have, the more difficult it is to face these crises. Yeah, and, and Matt, just a, a quick pivot to the business community. You know, I'm concentrating on people having a roof over their head. Um, we're also seeing the side effects of the slowdown and the pandemic on the business community, especially the small businesses in this city. Um, it's astounding to me the number of small businesses, particularly in the retail and restaurant industries, that have folded over the last six to seven months. Um, do we have any sense uh, from the mayor or from the council as to any assistance programs that are gonna be extended for the small businesses? So we have had a first round of uh, assistance to businesses and we had more applications than we had money. Uh, we gave out a lot of money, but it's not enough for people. And again, this is something we have, you know, the $500,000 that the mayor wants to propose for the arts community. A lot of those are small businesses that didn't get caught up. They weren't addressed in the original care package. Um, and, you know, we need help from the state and federal government on that because we don't have enough money to just subsidize all the small businesses and the entire population of Somerville. Um, that's, that's where we're stuck right now is especially the federal government uh, they had the small business bailout, but it's just more is clearly needed. And we, we're, we're dependent on them to address these problems. Do we, uh, you mentioned the uh, 500,000 that the mayor is proposing. Um, he's got to bring that to the council. Do, stop me if I have this wrong. He's got to bring it to the council somehow um, to have you folks take a look at it and say, yeah, um, it's not gonna croak the budget as you approved it? Or does he have the power to shift behind the scenes to shift other sources of funding to, for that 500,000? Well, I found in the past that uh, the ability to shift the money is always there, much to my chagrin, but I do believe he's coming to us for approval for this $500,000. So that hasn't happened yet. Uh, but we intend on scrutinizing it. I hope it's something that we can do, uh, but we want to just make sure that we have the ability to make this happen. Uh, but that hasn't come to us just yet. We're coming into the colder weather, Matt, and I, I want to be a little careful talking about restaurants because as you know, I have a role that I play uh, with licensing. But one of the things that has come front and center is um, a practice by the food delivery services, such as Grubhub and some of the rest of them. Um, on Thursday, Senator Jalen is going to come on the show and she's going to talk about what they're doing at the Senate level. Any comments that you want to make about that? So uh, let me just set it up, is that a lot of these restaurants never had delivery services before. Um, 
And now because of the pandemic, they have a lot of takeout and delivery services. And those roles are being filled by companies like Grubhub and the rest of them. And what they found is that Grubhub and some of the other services are charging exorbitant fees. It's almost like they're taking advantage of the whole situation. Do you have any comments on the Somerville level here? Well, yeah, they definitely are taking advantage of the situation. And it's unfortunate because it is a good business that I've used in the past uh, to order food from places that normally don't have delivery services. Uh, the city of Somerville did place an order requesting information on how to address this. And much like a lot of things, the answer came back, we need the state to do something about it. So I, I'm glad Senator Jalen is addressing this on the state level. And I hope they do something about it because they are charging exorbitant fees for their delivery services. Um, and it really just kills me if anybody uses the app, uh, most of the delivery drivers get at least a 20% uh, tip on top of the salary they're getting paid. Uh, so most of this money is most likely going straight to the business. So they could afford, if anything, they should reduce their prices so that more businesses take advantage of it. They'll still make their money and the small businesses will make money. Uh, so I definitely support Senator Jalen on that. I hope the state does something about it. Well, until the state does something about it from a personal standpoint, Matt, I have used delivery services in the past and uh, anyone who knows me, you know, I double check what I'm being charged. I don't just sign a slip. Um, and I perused one of those slips and I was shocked at how much money is being charged um, for that delivery service. Now I understand everybody, you know, some people have shifted and they've gone to being drivers. Lyft and Uber now has less passengers because of the restrictions, but some of those drivers have shifted over to become Grubhub drivers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not blaming them, but I am saying right now, those delivery services are not gonna get my business. Yeah. Now, I know it may hurt the restaurants a little bit, but there's always pickup. I can, I can get out to restaurants and I can pick up myself. I'm not gonna use those services until they bring their fees back in line. So well, I'll tell you too, when, when you look at your slip, you're looking at what you're being charged. That doesn't include what they're charging the restaurant too. So that's the issue. It's like if the individual buyer wants to pay an extra $10 to have the food delivered to them, uh, that's not as bad to me, even though I don't want to pay $10, as it is that you're charging the business the exorbitant fee, which like they, they really take a huge chunk out of the restaurant industry. And I know a few restaurants in the community have decided not to use that app because it's just taking too much money from them. Uh, I would recommend people outside of pickup, you know, a lot of these places, they do have delivery services. Um, you can call them directly. I think that's the best answer is to call the restaurant directly and try to get uh, work through them. So you don't pay the fee and they don't pay the fee. Yeah, I, that's good advice, Matt. You know, all of these restaurants have a phone number. Call the phone number. Yeah. Because if you're using the app, one of the things that Senator Jalen, and, and I was slightly aware of it, but one of the things that she and the three restaurants that are coming on on Thursday is that when you use that app, you don't know if it's you're ordering directly through Grubhub or you're ordering from the restaurant. Because what's happening now is Grubhub is hijacking the menu and you're actually ordering from Grubhub. They're service being the hell out of the restaurants. And then their driver is going to pick up as if you had placed the order. So it's just, you know, they're double dipping. I think the state and the feds are gonna to have to do something. They're gonna to have to crack down. But in the meantime, I think it's up to all of us. You know, the weather is still good. Get out and pick it up or use one of the outdoor dining areas if you feel comfortable. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And that's what I've done basically is I either get pick up and this was even before the pandemic too. Like one of my favorite spots is Lotus on Broadway. Um, and they stopped using Grubhub. Well, they still do use Grubhub, but the owner told me, hey, just call us directly. I call them because uh, ginger ale is not on the Grubhub menu, but they still have it. So I'll call them and say, hey, can I get a ginger ale with that? Matt, I, I, all I can say is I watched a little bit of the council meeting last week. And um, as only Matt, Councillor Matt McLaughlin can say, about a board order that was in there from four years ago 
trying to get a certain uh, ordinance passed. Let's do it because I'm getting impatient. <laughs> ah, did I say that directly? I think that's how I felt. I don't think I, I, that that was the demolition review ordinance, and we were discussing it for four years. And the biggest hang up was how many months the de delay should be. And my thing, what I did say is, you know, at some point you just have to pick a date and go with it. Uh, you know, sometimes you just need action. Action is more important than making the perfect decision sometimes. Well, congratulations, Councilor McLaughlin. It only took three, three board presidents or three council presidents to get it passed. Well, I, I take no credit for that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you want to close out with, Matt? We may see you with a guest next week, I hear. Yes, I'm going to have uh, Council Ewan Campin with me. I've uh, put out a call to ask uh, all the councilors who are interested. So we should have a steady uh, slate of guests here on out. Great. All right, Matt, thank you so much again for joining us. Thanks for everything that you do. And thanks for keeping the public informed. All right, thanks, Joe. All right, for Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. See you next time. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Joe.